Okay, so today we're going to talk about the biotech lab. So this is the Jack the Ripper lab. And I'm going to try to go through it really quickly, but obviously when I say pause and let students make hypotheses, that's when you're going to do that. So you're going to start out with the introduction to this. It's the Terror in Whitechapel. So I would have a student read the introductory paragraph. This is about Jack the Ripper, and it's one of the greatest uh, unsolved mysteries of, of history. So students are usually really excited to know more about it, and it's still to this day it remains unsolved, but there are people trying to solve it in various ways that we're going to be using today in this lab. So once you introduce that, you're going to say, all right, with your partner I want you to answer questions one and two. And you give them a second or a while to think about this. So number one is asking them what would they need to solve this case, obviously DNA of some kind. Um, but then number two, it says if we could obtain DNA, what's it going to tell us? Why, why is DNA helpful? And so, oh, let me back up. For number one, it asks whose DNA do you want? And so for this, ask students to come up with reasons or, or people that they need DNA from. So obviously, you would want uh, perpetrator DNA. So we have the body. You're going to have the body laying out. This is Jack the Ripper's first victim. Okay, Mary Ann, whatever it is. Anyway. This is Jack the Ripper's Marianne Nichols. This is his first victim, so you're going to lay the body out, say that I went to the cemetery and I exhumed her body, and here it is. So if I had the body, which we could do even now today, if I had the body, what would I do with it? What, where would I get DNA? And so students might suggest, you know, on their, on their skin, but the skin is gone, she's just bones. Um, but I would mention, hey, this was his first victim, so he probably wasn't as good as he was later on at and not getting scratched or beat up by the victim, and so probably the victim scratched him as she was being slayed, and so you could look under her fingernails. Um, if he sexually assaulted her, you might find DNA in the pelvic cavity. Um, so those are some of the things you're looking for to find perpetrator DNA. And then what else? And then you ask students, what else would you need? Who else's DNA would you need? And suspects, potential suspects is another one. So suspects can be, you know, anyone, and, and in fact, when the case was going on, they had lots of suspects and they gathered all kinds of evidence from these suspects, and it's still, some of that evidence is, it still exists today. In fact, there was an article just recently where a guy got a hold of, the, it was a scarf that supposedly belonged to Marianne Nichols, um, and they were extracting DNA from the scarf. But we've got coats, we've got clothing, we can even look at ancestors of the victim, of the possible suspects and gather DNA from them. And then the only other place where you need DNA is from the victim herself. Because when you're running these DNA samples, you want to be able to rule her out. All right, so I would write a list on the board, you know, we need the victim, we need the perpetrator, and we need suspects, okay? All right, so those are the DNA we need. And then number two, ask them, what does the DNA tell us? Like, how do we know? And intuitively, students will know that somehow DNA is different. But you need to remind them to sequence the entire genome of one individual versus another individual would be extremely expensive. Not only that, but if you, so, so you might say, well, let's just pick a gene or two and see if they're different. But genes, because they have a function, are incredibly conserved. And so if you compared my like hemoglobin gene to your hemoglobin gene, they would be just about identical. So what region of the DNA need we, need we to look at? in order to find these subtle differences, because it's not going to be in gene coding areas, most likely. I mean, maybe, but most likely you're not going to be looking at coding areas, and we can't sequence the whole genome. That's just too expensive. So we want to look at junk sequences, junk sequences in between genes, these, these introns. Now, they're not actually introns within a gene. They're intergenic sequences between genes. And in there, we have what we call STRs, short, tandem repeats. Hold on, I'm just going to make sure this is still recording. Okay, so short tandem repeats are short sequences in these intergenomic sequences that are short sequences. They are in tandem and they repeat. So you might have CGC, 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 etc. And so you would call this sequence right here would be a CGC3. It's been repeated three times. And so these sequences, because they're repetitive like this, when the machinery comes in to copy DNA during the S phase, like we're going to do mitosis, sometimes it gets caught up on these repeated sequences. And so the repeated sequences tend to change length, how many repeats you have with each generation, because it just it has a hard time um, 
syncing up the DNA when it's copying them, and maybe not within father to son or whatever, but within lineages, you will find differences in these repeats. And we have these STRs all over our genome. So you can look at 20 different sites of STRs, and let's say you have you know, a CGC10 here, and you have an AATA15 here, and you have an ATGC27 here, your signature of STRs is going to look different from everybody else in this room. Everybody's going to have a different STR signature, and that is called your DNA fingerprint. Okay, so we do an STR analysis and we look for those differences in repeats. So that's what we're going to be looking for today. Okay? So once you've explained that, then you're going to have them do the next step, which is isolating and amplifying our sample. Okay, so this is where they're going to go through the Meselson and Stahl experiment. So it sort of explains um, DNA, and it sets up the Meselson install experiment. So you're going to briefly give an introduction to the Meselson install, and just say, you know, people are wondering how in the world does DNA copy itself in the body, and this becomes important because we can do it in a test tube. So we need to know how it's done normally, and then we can do it in a test tube. And you're not going to go through the details this time of DNA replication. We're going to leave that to Dr. Callaway or Dr. Jo uh, Johnson or Dr. Adams for me. All right. So. Um, Anyway, the measles and install experiment, what he did is he took uh, uh, cells and he grew them in, in heavy nitrogen. So it was a nitrogen isotope, has extra neutrons. And he grew them in the heavy nitrogen, and that's the parental cell line. So the parental cell line, all the DNA, the two strands are both heavy. We'll just use red as heavy, okay? So the two strands are heavy. And, oh, and you want to mention there were three, three hypotheses for how DNA replicated. So it's the conservative, which means that, like we would look at it, we look at the DNA and we make an exact copy, okay? So you just copy it. The semi-conservative was this idea that maybe the DNA splits and then we copy both sides. And then the dispersive model is that maybe there is no rhyme or reason to it where it's creating a duplicate, but it's just kind of piecemealing it all together. Okay, and that one makes the least sense to me, but it was a hypothesis at the time. So to test them, the measles and install experiment. And so anyway, so they grew, and I'm, I need to grab an eraser, just one second. Yes, you have to do that until it's really resolved. So this is in the microwave too. Okay, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Okay, so um, they grew a parental line, all in heavy nitrogen. And then they transferred the cells into normal nitrogen, lighter nitrogen, and they let it go through one round of DNA replication. And then they transfer, or then we, they kept it in the light nitrogen, let it go through a second round. So that's your first generation, your second generation on that graph. So you can see if it's conservative, what it would look like, if it's semi conservative, what it would look like, and if it's dispersive, what it would look like. So then when it was done, they isolated the cells, they chewed them all up, they isolated the DNA, and then they spun it in a centrifuge tube. So if this is your tube, they're spinning it in the centrifuge tube. And if the strand is heavy, heavy, it's going to end up heavy down at the bottom of the tube. If the strand is like a heavy and then light strand, so it's half and half, it's going to end up somewhere in the middle where half is heavy and half is light. Open. Okay, and if it's a completely light strand, it's not going to 